Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn. On this episode, Vincent LaRusser and I are going to discuss the newest Kiss off the soundboard release that includes the late Mark St. John on guitar. There's so much to talk about this release, lots of things to cover. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode, so let's jump in and let's get started. Everybody, welcome to the latest episode of the Rock Experience with Mike Brunn. Today, I'm excited to have back with me my buddy, my partner Hello. in crime, Hola. the chemist, <laughs> Mr. Vincent Larusa. The crowd goes yeah. wild. <laughs> well, I know about that. Uh, yeah. Two people clap their hands. <laughs> yeah. You, you can. <laughs> uh, how's it going, buddy? Good. Excellent. Excellent, Excellent. on this. Excellent. This fine day. Yeah, so obviously we're here today now to talk about the newest Kiss release mm. off the soundboard from Binghamton. Um, no, from Poughkeepsie. Binghamton, sorry, I was no, gonna say. Not so from am, I, am, I, am I on the wrong episode? Yeah, yeah, like, you're on. I'm, better... I'm on the next one. Yeah, yeah. No, from Poughkeepsie, and um, right off the top, this is what the series is about to me. The off mm -hmm. the soundboards. It doesn't have to be a picture perfect recording. For me, an off the soundboard is something that. I haven't heard before. So many people are like, oh, well, they should release. And then they fill in a blank of a bootleg that's been out there for 20 years. And I'm like, nah, I want something that I don't know exists. And this, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to top something like this in my mind in terms of rarity of what mm -hmm. I would expect. Um, so before we get into the details of it, just, yeah, what are your thoughts overall just about the fact that it's a show at Mark St. John? Well, I mean, that's always been the mystery, right? What did that mm -hmm. sound like? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I wasn't present at any of those shows. And even if I was, how would I even really have a good recollection of it other than, you know, I was in my youth, you know? <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, these are the, these are the, you know, I think what's most impressive is knowing that there's stuff that's out there that hasn't been leaked at this point. There's still right. some gems that, that, that kiss has in their arsenal or, or universal or whoever has it, you know, control right. over this stuff. But, you know, there's not, I mean, other than, you know, pre getting their first album release, you know, of where you could get some sort of pristine, you know, soundboard recording of that. I mean, this might be it as far as like um, something is like a, like a holy grail type of thing. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know if anything else. Uh, um, maybe you could say if there was a, and you would know if this even exists, I'm just throwing out there the the palladium show you know with eric carr you know what i mean something that, like that That was my thoughts yesterday when i listened yeah. to this what would be equal to this in terms of yeah. excitement and, and i said palladium 1980 palladium yeah. soundboard right. yeah that yeah. would be exciting and even that i don't think is and, and not to say that mark st john was as significant as eric carr because obviously he's not not to put mark st john down but just because of tenure right. but there's so many recordings with eric carr that we have of him playing including the, the palladium there's a bootleg of that right right exactly so but this, like you said, only a handful of shows, you know, I know, I think some shows he did half, you know, and then Bruce he did one half up. show and two full shows. And this is right. the first of the two shows. And oddly enough, the half show was available on bootleg. Yeah. And the Binghamton show was available on bootleg. The Poughkeepsie yeah. show was not available in bootleg at all. So now yeah. actually, whether it's bootleg or the soundboard, all two and a half shows that Mark was a part of Kiss and now documented. So this is what I would love to know. And they might not even answer the question if you got a Doc McGee, if you got a Paul Stanley or Gene Simmons. Yep. Who had this all these years? Where did it sit? So here's how my, did it stay pro yeah. protected? You know what I mean? So so here's my guess. And I'm going to totally now, I'll, I'll say some facts and then I'm going to interject some of my personal opinion. So the tour started on September 30th in England somewhere. I don't remember where. It doesn't matter. But it started at the end of September. 
the beginning of December is in Detroit is when they were filming the Animalize video, mm. right? That the official video that came out. This show is about two weeks or so before the filming of that. Mm. Up until this point, they've been playing with Bruce Kulick from September through October through mid-November. I'm guessing they know they have this big video MTV concert that they're filming coming up in two weeks. Mark is feeling better. And my guess now, here's where my guest part comes in. So everything I just said is fact. Now my guest comes in is they were like, well, do we film that concert with Mark? Or do we go with what's more comfortable with us with Bruce? And then probably somebody says, well, let's record a show with the first show with Mark. Let's record it. Let's see how it sounds. And let's think if this is something that we think would translate on a video. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing somebody said, all right, I'll put a tape in the, in the soundboard, uh, an audio tape, a cassette. Mm. I'll record it. We'll go back and listen and we'll make our decision. Yeah. I suspect that's why this show exists. Now, I don't know that. Nobody's ever said it, but I would think that this has been sitting in Paul Stanley or Gene Simmons' house on a cassette for whatever it is, almost 40 years as a means. So, so I'm thinking they listened to this cassette. Again, I'm making this whole part up and said, Mark. Bruce, Mark Bruce, who should be on that Detroit video? And they ultimately yeah. decided Bruce. Yeah. I guess that's why this tape exists. I don't yeah. know, but that's what I was thinking. I'm going to debate you on this one to, that Go it's ahead. a cassette. I think I don't think it's a cassette because the reason, and I don't think it's been sitting in anybody's house for however many years. I can't do math right now; it's too early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because of the almost because of the, yeah, thank you. Uh, because of the sonic quality of it, it just does not sound to me. It. I mean, it very well could be, but I think it's like a two track, you know, recording on reel to reel, you know, that's that they recorded up. It was just because the fidelity is so high. First of all, for a cassette to last 40 years, unless it's been stored in proper place, you know, moves and stuff like, I don't know. I just find it hard to believe. Um, also, I, I think also because of the length of it, you know, as you know, and you remember as a kid, 60 minute tape, 90 minute tape, 120 minute tape. The higher, you, the longer you went in length of tape, the thinner the tape was, less fidelity, less quality. You know? Well, so, here we go. Now I'm going to debate. So I think they've said that you know, it was a tape. And the reason I think that that's accurate is because one of the things I did, because I'm a nut, is when I was listening to it, well, the first thing I noticed is that the whole release was 80 minutes. And I was like, hmm, all right, 80 minutes. If it's on a cassette, a cassette's 90 or 60 or 120, right? But mm -hmm. let's say 90. What happened to the other 10 minutes if it's a 90 minute cassette? What, what's missing? You know, that was the first thought I had. Mm -hmm. So as I'm listening to it for the first time, I set my timer on my phone and I said, right, I know that there's a cut in Young and Wasted, which is where they're saying that there's a quote unquote tape flip. Mm -hmm. How long into the show is that cut? And it was 41 minutes and 58 seconds on my timer. So let's just call it 42 mm -hmm. minutes. So that sounds like side A of a cassette. And then side B was only 37 minutes. And we'll talk about what I think is missing in a moment, mm -hmm. but it lends to the fact that it was recorded on a 90 minute cassette in my mind. The fact that there was the tape flip at the 45 minute mark roughly. Yeah. I mean, I guess it, it's, it's quite very possible. I, you know, I just wonder, you know, back then were most shows being taped, you know, they mm -hmm. just, you know, you're bringing the same rig every night. Right. And if you're having your rack or whatever they had back then, they would tape it, you know, and then, you know, just have it for the band, yep. for potential, whatever. I mean, yeah, when they're doing an Alive and Alive 2 and Alive 3, you have a multi-track recorder. You want to go in and mix those elements, mm -hmm. you know. Um, for me, it, it sounds, yeah, there's certain things that, but it certainly sounds mixed. And obviously, you're getting a mix for live. Um, it's it's interesting. I think there was one point when I was listening, it almost sounded like the bass dropped out. You know, I didn't really <laughs> even hear the bass. And I was wondering, did that actually happen? Or was it just a levels thing? You know what I mean? Because right. you can't go back. It's not a multi-track. That's the one thing I'm absolutely confident. It's not a multi-track that they have here. Right. But I guess if you, you know, based on your theory of, an, I mean, I'm looking on 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 my um, title, which is my um, my streaming service. It says an hour and 19 minutes. And right. nine seconds, which is right under 120, which is right 120. So that's it's, yeah, yeah, no, that's a no, no. Minute, right? it's, no a, it's it's 79 minutes long. It says 18 tracks, one one nineteen oh nine. Wouldn't that be an hour and 20 minutes? Yeah, right. 79 minutes. Oh, I, oh, I thought you meant in total. 
Yeah, no, it's seventy nine yeah. minutes in total. Like, the, total, the okay, all right. Yeah, yeah man, right. I, I mean, you really tell it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Saturday morning oh, for me. Yeah, really. Come on, I'm the yeah. one that went running ten miles before this. I'm yeah, but you're, you're, you also exhausted. work with numbers. You're an account. Uh, you, you know, oh, okay, you know. Yeah. I, there you go. Good excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the whole release is seventy nine minutes long. Right. Okay. So, and, and again, I'll talk in a moment what I think some of the things were cut out and, and get some of your thoughts on it. But um, yeah, I'm fairly certain that this is a, and I'll say this. In recent years, I came across. I'll debate you still that it was hanging out in Gene and Paul's house. I think it was somewhere else that they. they well, were that that could this. be. Yeah. That could yeah. be. But in, in recent years, and it I does can... sound like a first generation for sure. Yes. yes. Yeah. In, in recent years, I was lucky that I came across a couple of audio tapes that were recorded from the soundboard in the early '80s, and they sound similar to this. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't the Animalized tour, but it, but it sounds similar to to mm-hmm. this in terms of overall quality. And this, these tapes were kept in a in a good place. So I do believe that this is from a tape, a cassette that was stored properly for 40 years. Mm-hmm. I really do. But what did you think of the performance overall? Right? Let's talk about that. What, what, I mean, obviously, especially you probably never heard any of the shows with Mark. What was your overall impression of Mark playing on these songs and the show? Well, first of all, just from from the top, you know, I had the Animalize Uncensored as kind of a, you know, a compare because the, I mean, they were, it was the same tour, it was, like you said, huh. it was so close to play. So they were two they weeks were later performing, mm-hmm. yeah, pretty much every song they perform, kind of just like, like that 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 video. I think there was something in Eric's drum solo that was a little bit different. Uh, I know this because I know that drum solo like the back <laughs> of my hand because I used to try to play it. Um, it was an interesting thing to hear you know, like a Colgin guitar solo or whatever, you know, there really was like no elements of ace, you know, (laughs) in in, in Mark's playing, you know, it was interesting, like hearing live uh, under the gun and stuff like that, because, you know, we know those solos for the album. I mean, it was a really an exciting listen. Of course, it was a reminder on some songs like, oh, my God, this tempo and the song is really like what? And I know what they were thinking, you Mm -hmm. know, um, and also that, from my recollection, and I was going to actually fact check this, it sounded like on some of the classics, they went up a half step, like on Cold Gin, it's not okay. turned down a half step to make it sound brighter and peppier and all that and not as dark because it was the mid 80s. Right. Everybody was trying to chasing, you know, that 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 Van Halen, Def Leppard, you know, Quiet Riot, yeah. everything that was kind of being popularized at that time. You know, I, I thought and I thought about this immediately, like when I heard Cold Gin, I'm like thinking. Now, if Mike hears this, is he still going to think it's boring hearing it this way? Because <laughs> there is a certain like excitement uh, or difference in, in hearing Cold Gin that way that I've so forgotten about. I'm going to pause you, know? you there for a moment, right? Because that is one of the things that I did pick up on. And I was listening to it yesterday in the car. So I, you know, I was by myself. I had a nice, you know, had it playing loud. Mm-hmm. And instantly I'm like, all right, well, the tempos, we all know the tempos for the 80s songs. But one of the things I thought, and I could be 100% wrong with this because I haven't watched the Analyzer video in a while. Mm-hmm. I thought the tempos were slightly slower than mm-hmm. what they would do. And, and and I was wondering, did they play slightly slower that night? Did somebody just slow down the recording slightly? Mm-hmm. Um, or am I just completely wrong? And I could be completely wrong with this. And when I was hearing mm-hmm. Cold Gin, I'm like, you know, this song is boring and I don't really love it. But this version on this off the soundboard might be my favorite version of Cold Gin. So it's mm-hmm. very funny that you said that. It still doesn't you know, make it go to a 10 out of 10 rating for me. But maybe instead of a 5 out of 10, this recording makes it like a 5.2 out of 10. I thought you might give it a little bit more than 0.2, but I don't all right, know. I 5. It... 2, 1, all right, you happy? Uh, you, you hate it. Just, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I just think it's very average and extremely yeah. overrated. But mm-hmm. I do think on this off the soundboard, it might have been my favorite released version of this song. Yeah. And again, a lot of, and some of the other tunes, just for what you asked earlier, just, you know, they're, uh, they're just a bit too fast. You know, you're, mm-hmm. you're kind of losing, you know, you're just losing whatever the feel, you know what I mean? You know, most bands, when they play in concert, they're going to play it a little faster, but and you know this was definitely very intentional i don't think like you know this would have just slipped by gene and paul if they didn't want that you no, know what of i course mean not. No. yeah so there's no way they're letting eric play those tempos and then say oh gee yeah, he's playing all the wrong tempos oh well yeah. nothing we could do about that <laughs> you know, yeah. no way that's yeah. happening <laughs> yeah yeah but um 
No, no, and it's interesting, you know, and I'm trying to think, like, why would they do an Oh Susanna? Like, what was their idea behind that instead of doing, like, a classic song? I mean, it's kind of fun to listen to. And they did that pretty much the entire tour every night. So I don't know what the thought process there was. Yeah, yeah. It's just interesting because, you know, back then, even then, we were starving for some classics. And I think people much rather hear Strutter or whatever, you know, um, and they're doing Oh Susanna, which is kind of fun and quirky. But, you know, I mean, and, and then again, if it didn't exist, you know, we wouldn't have kids kind of doing something out of their element, so to speak, you know. So, so, kinda, so let me ask you this question. Track. I'm glad you brought that up now. So because it dovetails into one of the thoughts I had. So like I said, this is supposed to be on a 90 minute cassette. And the first thing I noticed is that the release is 80 minutes. So I'm like, all right, well, I knew Young and Wasted was cut. I knew Rock and Roll All Night was cut. So it wasn't a full show, but I sh- should still have a 90 minute release. Now, I know CDs are not 90 minutes and they wanted to put it on one CD. So as I'm listening, I'm like, well, I'm missing 10 minutes from the audio tape. What is missing? And I'm listening with a fine tooth comb to everything. Like I said, I'm by myself. I even listened to it this morning again when I was running with my headphones on to see if I could hear where there were cuts. And I could. So like right after Detroit Rock City ends and he's like, woo, how you doing, Poughkeepsie? You could hear that there's a cut in between mm-hmm. the song ending and him saying, woo, sorry, they cut out some crowd cheering, but whatever, that doesn't matter to me. I know, having listened to many bootlegs, that it sounds like the intro to um, Heaven's on Fire. Usually he'd go into this whole spiel and mm-hmm. name drop a couple of bands that he didn't like at the time or whatever. I'm guessing that's all edited out. Certainly his whole intro before Love Gun that used to be like 17 hours long, um, that's all edited out. Mm-hmm. Would you rather have, I'll give you three choices. And there's some musical things I think cut out also. And I'll talk about those in a moment. But if given a choice and it was going to be only one CD, would you rather have had them cut out Oh Susanna and put in some of these infamous Paul intros or would you rather have had, you know, Oh Susanna there and cut the intros? Yeah, I don't need the Tony Banta in between the songs. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, and I, I've heard Paul do that enough. You know, I'd rather hear another track or something, you know, a full song, even if it's an Oh Susanna, right. you know, okay. especially if that was kind of unique to them. They would, they like you said, they did it on the tour. Right. You know, and it's not on the Animalized Uncensored video. Correct. You know, yep. even clearly on the Animalized Uncensored video, you could see where they did some editing. There's, you know, yep. it's, it's, there's definitely cuts in that. Would you but, rather uh, it have been two CDs, have to pay more to buy it if you're buying it, and then get both the, the uh, I was at the doctor today, whole Love Gun intro, <laughs> and oh, Susanna, are you okay with, hey, I got 80 minutes, I'm good. I don't really need it. I heard Paul do it enough. And, <laughs> and, you know, and I mean, that's the one thing I wanted to bring up about this. It was a reminder that like, you know, first of all, Paul, you know, you'd like, where's this guy from? He does <laughs> not sound like a guy from Queens. You know what I mean? Agreed. Yeah. Um, and his he was really a master at that in between songs because, I mean, he kind of does it today, but not like he used to do it. Like, you Agreed. know, like you said, when he would talk about Love God, he used to go into a whole. And I remember because if you watch the Analyze yes. uh, Uncensored mm-hmm. video, he did a lot of that. And yes. he really was a master showman, you know, as as far as, as, far as a front man. And to me, he was taking a page get... out of the Dave Lee Roth book at that time. Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Because even in the seventies, he would go a little bit into it. You know what I mean? But but not you like know? the the ten minute intro to Love Gun like he used to. No, 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 no. To no. me, that that no, was no. I always thought that was an attempt to, like you said earlier, match up with the Van Halens of the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I will and, say um, this though, the the Tony Banther, as he called it in between the songs, I could have done without the uh, anybody need a drink out there? It's hot. Anybody should we pass out drinks? And they be we have to like the third or fourth time and like boo, boo, you're not passing out drinks to everybody enough. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I I was surprised they left those comments in. But at the same time, I guess it kind of just paints the picture that it was really freaking hot in that arena that night for whatever reason, because like yeah. every four or five songs, he was like, should we pass drinks out to everybody in the crowd? Are you guys thirsty? And then one point he's like, yeah, we're passing out four drinks. Share it with everybody. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's wow. Like bizarre. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. But yeah. So we knew that there was going to be some cuts in the music, right? We knew mm. Young and Wasted was going to be cut and, and rock and roll all night. But I believe there's two other musical cuts on this release. Well, there's no set list for this night that's, that exists out there? Like no, there was no set list. But, but I'm a, and I'm not saying that they cut whole songs. Mm. But I think the end of War Machine, Gene used to breathe fire in that song. Mm. So, you know, it was a lot of the, like, you know, 
the ringing guitar noise, then not the sirens, but it's just like, and then you blow the fire. That was extremely short on this release. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, they probably trimmed that back, which is not the end of the world to me at all mm -hmm. if they did. But I'm guessing they trimmed 20, 30 seconds off of that, you know, while he was actually breathing fire. Mm -hmm. But the one that really, I have to think they cut this, is that they cut a piece of Black Diamond out. So, you know, there's like the whole, like they go through the whole song and then the ending is the musical part before it goes, dan, 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 and they're coming down the thing. Well, right before that, um, usually like Eric, um, Peter originally like, has, has the public, doom, 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 bang, dan, 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 mm. thing, right? that's not there. Mm. That whole, doom, doom, doom. as soon as when that's supposed to come, it goes, tss, 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 dan, and, they, and the, the whole like ending. And I, I was interested to hear what Mark was going to do during like, like that, because there's a whole guitar solo part there, doom, 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 bang, dan, dan, and then they go a whole guitar mm. solo. Mm. I can't believe they didn't perform it that night. There's no way, because I, if I remember right from the Animalized video, that's when they were running up the big ramp that would go to the ceiling, then they would come down on it, and they'd come down during the, the ending part, that, da -na 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 -na, which is there, and you could hear what I call like the airplane sounds of, of the thing coming down. as it. So they definitely did it that night. I, why they cut that? Did Mark mm. totally butcher something there? Did the mm. band totally butcher something there? Did Eric just accidentally skip the part? I don't believe so. Not for a second, I don't believe so. But that will nag at me. <laughs> that mm. why is there 15 or 20 seconds of Black Diamond Miss? And I know I'm being very nitpicky right now. And probably some people say, oh, I didn't even notice that. But mm -hmm. I did. When I when I, I was like, was I not paying attention? Rewind. Let me listen to that again. I'm like, that part of the song is not there. So mm. there's my long rant about <laughs> the one thing that bothered me. <laughs> Yeah, I got to check that out. I got to listen to that and put on with headphones to really hear, you know, where the, if, if there's a cut there. When I was yeah. running this morning, because yes, I was listening in my car and when I and when I noticed it, when I was running this morning, I listened and if there is a cut, it's extremely clean, but it's not surprising because uh, the usually the music would stop then it's doom, 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 bang, right? And instead the music mm -hmm. stops and it's yeah, right. So there's a stop in both spots so it's a clean spot to cut it but i wonder why just cut mm. out 20 seconds of you guys need a drink or, you know, we'll pass four drinks around to the crowd and give me the rest of black diamond if it was really there um i want to know why was that cut yeah yeah no i mean i agree with you that they could have easily removed those other elements you know if they had to say well we could with this 15 second black diamond right well, you know, I mean, there was plenty of time where they could have got, you know, gained 15 seconds back. So I, maybe you're right. You know, I don't know. Just... I haven't seen anybody else comment about it online yet, though. And that's mm. why I'm like, I really was like, am I crazy? Is that missing? Yeah. I went back and listened to it a few times. I'm like, no, that that part of the song is missing. <laughs> you mm. know? So um, mm. so if anybody else who's watching or listening to this recognized it, give me your opinion on why you think that's out. Do you think Eric just mi mixed, you know, missed it that night and, and mm. went to the last do you think they cut it um were you there that night and, and do you remember i doubt anybody who's there would remember something that that yeah. minor but yeah. um like you said you listened and you didn't even realize it was missing yeah. but yeah. i did and of course again so i was timing everything and i can tell you side a to tape like i said before they have 42 minutes of the 45 so there's three minutes on tape that's missing from this recording mm -hmm. side b there's another 45 minutes ran only 37 minutes long on the CD. Mm. So there's about eight minutes missing. But I think most of that is, so I went to the doctor yesterday. I mean, I could hear a little cut after Young and Wasted and before Gene starts his solo. But again, I think that's just crowd noise that they take out. I don't care about that, you know? Well, also just remember, like if they were at the 42 second, 42 minute mark, mm -hmm. they might've stopped the tape and flipped it without rewinding and hit record. So you're, you, you know, you're cutting off three minutes at the end of the side one. The, the reason I don't think so, because they cut young and wasted in the middle, right? So I'm guessing that the song ended, you know, the, the tape ended in the middle of the song and the, the tape sat there for a minute. And then the guy said, Oh, look, it's not recording. Let me flip it. And that's why it goes from halfway through but the first verse to the solo. But up until I'm looking at Young and Wasted, that's 42 minutes, you're saying? Yeah, that's the 42 minute mark. But it would be 45 minutes, no? So why would they? Why so would I the think tape... I, I think there's three minutes cut out from side A. That's what I'm saying. I think that the intro to Heavens on Fire is cut, which is probably two or half of the three minutes. 
And then there's little cuts of where there was crowd just cheering. Why even cut that out? Why even cut that out? That's why I don't... I guess they want to fit everything onto an 80-minute CD. So that's a one CD release. Because if okay. you put those things on and it runs over 80 minutes, now you need two CDs. Is, it, is, it, is, it, is the official length for a CD 78? Or is it 80? Is it 78? I think it's 80. I think, it's 80. Right. I think yeah? it's 80. And this, and this clock's in at 79 minutes. So I yeah. know it's minor things, but it's just one of the things that... That you know, I'm always a completist, so I'm like, put out the one CD version. That's fine. On mm. the vinyl, give me the whole thing. You know, that's yeah. just me. It's a minor thing, minor nitpicking thing. I start off saying that this is the perfect off the soundboard release, yeah. and to me, I love. I you know, I've seen people complain about the sound, you know, on it. These things were never meant to be officially released. What are they complaining about I the think, sound? Uh, well, Chris, it you know, like when I was listening to it in the head in the headphones, it's not stereo in the sense you don't hear like a guitar on one side a guitar on the other everything's just center mm -hmm. you know so what this was yeah. never intended for an official release never yeah and the fact that it is i think it's pretty freaking awesome <laughs> well yeah you know what i really like there was there were some parts and, and and kind of just knowing some of this stuff which i was a little surprised at but, and I, I wouldn't even know why well, we knew we, we knew the guitars that paul was playing on this tour and kind of know that, you know, Mark was playing either some sort of Charvel or Jackson or Kramer or one of those type. But on some of the songs, it clearly sounds like a single, I don't get technical, a single coil guitar uh, pickup, not a mm. humbucker. Mm. And I was just surprised at some of the guitar tones on this because it sounded like that more trebly, like thinner guitar sound. And I was like, hmm, what the hell guitar were they using on this? Right. Interesting. You know, and um, that was one of the things I picked up. The other thing is, and I, I believe it's Detroit Rock City, has maybe one of the greatest Gene Simmons bass slides. <laughs> at one point, he goes, <laughs> like, I don't know. It's like, you know, like he just does it at a point. It's classic. I actually <laughs> laughed, of course, you know, of because, course. you know, we always went, went back. I think it's around the 125 into the song or something like that. You could tell Gene was totally thawed. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he does a bass slide where you, Never, I never heard him do it. Okay, I have to go and back that, and look to me, for that. You know, yeah, yeah, you gotta. It's like it's just a classic. It's just a classic genism, and uh, you know, the other thing I kind of was reminded about, and know this, of course, from the Animalized censored. Was like Paul Sandman was actually legitimately trying to do a guitar solo, mm -hmm. you know, trying to do some finger tap, yeah. you know, because that was, of course, the fad. I'm sure Paul's like, all right, let me get in on this and show yeah. that I'm just not this poser who plays guitar. You know what I mean? We yeah. all. Well, we, us Kiss fans know that you know Paul's a great rhythm player, um, and 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 has also done some great solos on on some of the Kiss tunes. Yeah. Um. So it was kind of fun hearing that, and even the bass solo. There was a couple of things that he did in this bass solo that's different from the Animalize, where I heard I was like, all right, Gene actually put a little thought into this. Like, yeah. there's some cool, cool things. I I, I knew I was going to do 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 do. Like I remember that one, but there was a couple other things he did on there that was kind of cool. And then he comes in, Eric comes in with a blam, 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 and they did they used to do that whole thing, which was cool. The other thing that's really cool is if you listen, and I had to go back because I was like around the house doing stuff, and and part of Eric's drum solo, he stopped, and I heard a voice on what, and if you listen here, you hear you hear Eric very low. Say you know, you know. Let me see. You get up off your out of your fucking chairs. Or you know, like he like no, he like he's, he yeah like on one of the breaks. And I'll go back and maybe after this I'll tell you mm -hmm. what it is. He he or or just really listen closely when he's mm -hmm. stopping. You hear a voice saying, and he hears Eric Carr's voice, and it's probably just the overheads picking him up. Sure. You know, saying you know, get up out of your fucking seat, or he definitely uses oh, wow. the f word. It's kind okay. of cool, like. Because you would see them like, you know, like, you know, doing things like right. that. Or, but you really didn't hear them in the crowd. Yeah, but it was, it's kind of like a cool moment. Oh, you know? I did pick up that all of a sudden in the middle of his drum solo, you hear like two bass notes. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I thought that was funny. It's like Gene's probably getting ready to like sit backstage and all of a sudden the bass like boom, boom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was yeah, funny. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I like that about the recording. It's just so pure and exactly what it was that night. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's it it was it's a it's a it's a great it's a it's a fun listen. Um, it's uh, you know, I, 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 obviously one of these things that we've always wondered about. You know, um, always wondering. We're like, I mean, even just the point, like, you know, yeah, Bruce was a great addition to the band. But what if Bruce never was there? What if yeah. Mark would have been the guitar player? How long would that have lasted? What would the records been like after that? Because obviously Bruce was a co-writer on 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 Asylum and and on um um 
uh, uh, Crazy Nights, Crazy and then of course his work with Revenge he got, and then and stuff all, obviously with uh, uh, Carnival of Souls, right? Yeah, like, all this, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, <laughs> you know the trajectory of Kiss would have been different, you know? Yeah. So, no, without a doubt. And to me, I'm listening to the guitar playing. And like you said before, even even with the guitar playing, sometimes the solos I felt drifted in sound in and out. Mm-hmm. I think during Black yeah, yeah. Diamond, all of a sudden I couldn't hear the solo. I'm like, where'd that go? You know what yeah, happened? Yeah, there? Yeah. But you know, yeah. again, this is all just forty year old recording. I'm thankful it's mm-hmm. there, imperfections and all. But to me, I'm listening to this, and you know, I've heard the bootlegs, but the bootlegs aren't the greatest quality. And I'm like, you know, Mark probably had, I would think, more in common, certainly with. Vinny Vincent than Ace Frehley, like you said before, mm-hmm. there's nothing about this that sounded like like uh, Ace Frehley. There were parts where I was like, you know, maybe like bits like a glove. He's doing the solo. I'm like, yeah, that's that's Vinny Vincent esque, <laughs> certainly. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, with all of the talk they have now about, you know, Vinny, he'd be playing solos and be like, rrr, rrr, and they'd want to shoot him or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, the next guy they brought in was pretty much a carbon copy of the style. Yeah, you know? I mean, one of the things I I, I know like. Again, fucking the classic Gene and Paul. They're like, you remember that? Like, he sounded like a bee. We just want yes. to kill it. Like, yeah. come on, man. You hired this guy to play like that. Stop already. I, I hated that. Yeah. Two guys like that. Yeah, right. It's exactly. not like they hired one and they said, uh, now that in hindsight, that's a mistake. They hired yeah. two. Right. And that's yeah. what I got from this record. It's like, no, Mark had a lot more in common with Vinny than with Ace or even Bruce. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, Bruce was like the perfect medium, like in between all of them. But Mark's style to me sounded closer. I'm not saying the same, but there's closer mm. to Vinnie Vincent than to Ace Frehley. That's for damn sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one well, of the one things of, I go ahead, will you say something? I was gonna say one of my favorite Mark St. John parts is the end of of under again. Fire, you know, like that fucking run he does. It's crazy, but it's awesome. You know what I mean? It is. And it fits the song to me. That's something where to me a crazy riff and run like that. It's it's a it's a tasteful little run right over there at the end. I agree. Well, I, I mean, even like let's let's face facts. Um, as crazy it was of playing back then, his intro solo and thrills in the night. I know it's not on here. Mm-hmm. I thought it was great. You know, it's yeah. not like I mean, it's not like out on the streets with Vinnie Vincent. You know, the guitar right. solo where you know it's just. I remember even back then saying, "Oh man, this is like a bad." I wish it was a little bit more like what he did on. Um, on on all systems go i think it was either on love kills or one of the ballads where he actually he actually scaled it back you know right, what i mean yeah. it was a really really good solo i thought yeah. you know no, i agree kind of going off you know and, and i always loved that side of Vinny's playing but that's a whole mm-hmm. other episode that we could spend yeah. a lot of time on mm-hmm. you know to me when i started listening to the cd right off the top the first song detroit rock city you knew you were listening to a different guitar player because and i don't know if this was just an echo effect they put on mark's guitar or if he was playing it this way i'm guessing he's playing the it doubling. this way yeah the i was like yeah yeah i was like that's actually a little interesting <laughs> i've never yeah. heard that before it didn't sound like a lack it sounded like he was plicking it plicking yeah it, picking it picking multiple times yeah i noticed yeah. that too i picked up on that i was like what the? i never heard that before no i've you know? never heard that before yeah. if it's on the other shows the bootlegs i didn't pick up on it but yeah. um I picked up on it the second I, I, in fact, that was another spot where I rewound. Like, well, let me listen to that again. I was like, all right, you know, it's not the classic that we love. It, it mm-hmm. is, but it, it's a little variation of it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that, that's, that's interesting. It's an yeah. interesting little twist over there. Yeah. I, 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 I yeah. didn't mind it. It was like, um, but right off the top, I'm like, all right, well, that's a different guitar player because Bruce never did that. Vinny never did that. Ace never mm-hmm. did that. Tommy's never done that. That's somebody else playing guitar over there. So I thought mm-hmm. that was just like, a nice way even just to start the CD is like, all right, you know, you're listening to somebody different, even just on a classic solo that, that he plays the same in Detroit Rock City, but he gave it a little bit different flavor. I, I kind of liked it, actually. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let me just think about this, too. You know, of, of, of that era of the guitar wars type of thing, you know, Paul Stanley gets the guitar solo that night, not your lead guitar player. You know, and we understand why that is because Paul was doing that thing, you know, with the crowd yeah. and, you know. Which is another thing. spot I think they cut a little bit. Yeah. Thankfully, yeah. I don't need that. There's a little spot on the CD, but but not the whole time, which is yeah. fine with me. Which is, I think, another reason why Paul felt like he had to legitimize in a way is like his guitar solo to give it a little bit more, you know. Yeah. Like, all right, I got some technical ability here. You know what I mean? So. Yep, yep. I thought yeah. this for some silly reason when I'm listening to this CD. First off, to me, Eric Carr on this performance to me was a monster. He stood mm-hmm. out like the whole time. I'm like, damn, yeah. He, yeah. I know the tempos are fast and all of that, but his playing in, in, to me on this CD is rock solid. And it made me mm-hmm. miss him for, for mm-hmm. a little bit as I'm listening to this. But when he gets to his solo, I don't know why I was thinking this while I was listening to this. So I want to ask you this question. 
Do you prefer when you go to a concert, if they're going to do a drum solo, that it's a standalone, standalone track the way this was, like a song ends and then all of a sudden, you know, Eric does a five minute drum solo. Or do you like when they like embed it into a song like God of Thunder and then there's the drum solo and then they come back out of drum solo back into the song? Do you have a preference or am I just really, really like overthinking that. this? No, no, I like that. I mean, I think that's what makes, you know, Kiss Alive, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like the whole thing, even within 100,000 years when Peter's going to and then that'll do that and he starts doing that whole thing. You know, I love that. And then they go back into the tune. I am not a huge fan of solos of any kind, you know, Same. guitar, bass, mm -hmm. guitar, uh, drums. So that's why I like this is where they take a break mm -hmm. and they do their little thing and then they come back, they tie it into a song cle like cleverly. Mm -hmm. I, pre I, pre I prefer it that way. Me too, I think. Saying that, I'm so thankful that the full drum solo is on this release because it's the first, I know it's on the Animalize video, but it's the first on CD release of his drum solo, you know, mm -hmm. so to me, it was cool. And again, it put a big smile to my face and just his drumming to me, this whole show was, was spot on. It mm -hmm. just, I, I sat there, I'm listening to Mark's playing and the entire time I'm listening to Mark's playing, I'm smiling saying, and Eric is just, you know, he, he's, he gets a lot of black because of the tempos. And we just, we spoke about that sure mm -hmm. driven by Gene and Paul, but I'm, um, you know, go back and listen to their tempos in 1980 when Eric was playing, they were much, you know, standard and slower back mm -hmm. then, you know, so, but it, it made me smile the whole time listening to him playing drums. And um, I'm Absolutely. glad for that reason that this show is out there also. And I'm sure there'll be other ones with him released in the, in the months to come. Yeah. But um, this is the first one with him. I know the Creatures at Night stuff on the box set, but this is the first mm -hmm. like show on, on the Off the Sandboard series with him. And um, it just made me smile. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Same here. If I would have said to you in the 80s, or let's say it's 1990, and I say to you, hey, one day... There's going to be a Kiss Live album from the 80s, but it's not going to be Bruce Kulick. It's going to be Mark St. John. <laughs> what would have you thought the odds of that? Yeah, I mean, it was always like, even back then, it was like such a mystery. Yeah. You know, we didn't have internet to know what the hell was going on. I just remember being utterly confused. Even when Animalize Uncensored came out, I'm like, where's the, where's the new guy? What yeah. the hell happened to him? I, I, didn't, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't no, know. Look, Maybe you, I saw... The tour, I think, I think it was the first show after they decided to go back to Bruce, mm -hmm. right? It's Nassau Coliseum. I think it's November 27th, if I remember right. right so I think they did Poughkeepsie, Binghamton, and then Nassau Coliseum, right? Mm -hmm. So I was at the first show when they went back to Bruce. And I bring it up because I was all the way in the back. You know, everybody on stage was, you know, this big only. Mm -hmm. And you know, look, I was 13 years old at the time. So forgive me for what I'm about to say. But you were talking about Gene Simmons' bass solo before. Mm -hmm. And when Eric Carr comes in with the drums... I thought it was, in my 13-year-old mind, Gene, Eric, and the guitarist playing that part. Mm. So on my tape, I put Gene Simmons solo, and then right underneath it, Mark St. John solo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had yeah. no idea that right. night at the concert that I was not, again, I was far back, so so Bruce was only this big. And, um, you and know, they what didn't did I introduce know? the band. They didn't you know? introduce anybody. Yeah. What did I know? So silly me i thought it was a guitar playing along with the bass and the drums so i put mark st john solo so my mm. my recording that i made that night actually says mark st john on mm. it uh, yeah. because that's how little we knew and that's why i bring that up right at that time mm. we had no idea that mark was in he was out he's back in and now i'm seeing him and it's not even him you know i had right. no idea right. that night so yeah yeah sorry bruce <laughs> no yeah. disrespect meant but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. what did i know i was 13 years old and and the guitarist was this big and you know I didn't know that it wasn't Mark. No way to tell. No way no, to tell. No way, yeah. no way to tell at all. No way. Yeah. But um, sometimes I think, ah, oh, man, too bad Mark didn't last one more show. Well, not only that, too bad Matt Mark's not alive to hear this. I mean, we all know that like yeah. he had, you know, well, we all know, but maybe you don't know, that he struggled with some stuff, you know, and yep. um, he, he died at a way too young of an age, you know, and uh, he, you know, was not fortunate enough to hear a release to celebrate again we always talk about celebrating and this is kind of really more than anything celebrating mark st john i mean kiss has been sure. celebrated so many times with their releases this yes. is really celebrating mark's contribution to the band because he did play on that entire album as far sure. as i know on animalize there's no session players you know other Bruce, than i think does a couple of the solos yeah okay okay you know i don't think as bruce is a session player you know what i mean okay. Fair like, you know what i mean but yes. and i think i think i think 
I think Alan Schwartzberg supposedly did a couple of drum fills or something, yes. which I always thought mm-hmm. was crazy. You know what I mean? Yes. But um, but I think that is true. Um, but you know, it's it's really to celebrate Mark's legacy. You know, even if it's just the one album yeah. and the only a couple of shows or a shows and a half or whatever. You know. Um, so going back to my theory that they recorded this to listen to it to say, hey, who should we have on that Detroit show that we're going to film? Was there anything that you hear listening to this that you say, yeah, they definitely didn't want to go with Mark, thinking that it's his first show ever playing with them full, right? So he had played a half show before this. So the first half of the show, whether it's, you know, Detroit Rock City, Creatures of the Night, Cold Gin, you're listening to the first time he's performing these songs live with the band. Was there anything that stood out to you that like, yeah, that's why they decided not to go with him? No, no. Anything that I heard was purely a mixed thing or, you know, a sonic because of leveling or something like that. I didn't hear bum notes. I didn't hear like where he how, he didn't sound prepared. You know, it it <laughs> sounded like you know again there was an eighties guitar player playing Kiss songs for solos. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like what the style was, and I think certainly the tempos helped that. Is I mean it's understandable where you're trying to do these tempo. I mean these these fast runs on the guitar. If the song is not at a tempo to match that, those you know you still got you still got this as your tempo or this. You know what I mean? Yep. You're still gonna, and it's understandable why they 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 chose to speed up the songs. Yeah. So. Now I'll say this: there was a couple of things I thought. Listen to it first off. The only time I I can remember hearing where I'm guessing Mark forgot to play something or just lost his spot or whatever in Heavens on Fire when they have the after like the solo spot. Mm-hmm. There's there's like a it drops down and then like there's usually just like a few like guitar like chords. Dang. Yeah. And then they start saying, whoa, heaven's on fire. Right. You could hear Gene playing the bass, but yeah. there's no guitar over it. And I'm like, I right. yeah. sounds like Mark forgot to play those couple of notes, yeah. a couple of chords. Not a big deal to me, whatever. Who cares? To me, Again, some that of this... could have been a technical. That could have been. An... I, I heard some dropouts, too. And I right. said, is this technical or did and, they forget? And it know? could have been. It could have been. Um, there was no sound as I was listening to it in the headphones today. There was no sound, even faint of a guitar there. So it makes me think Mark just said, all right, we're out of the solo. We're going to go into the breakdown. I, mm-hmm. I forgot I had to play this chord five times, you know, before we start singing, mm-hmm. whoa, whoa, heaven's yeah. on fire. Yeah. Not a big, yeah. certainly not a reason to say, all right, we're not going to go with Mark because of that. Right? I did think some oh, yeah. of the solos yeah. on some of the songs sounded, I'll say half cooked, you know, um, there were some of them where I'm like, all right, I think that Mark given more time probably could have come up with something better there. Um, that's not to criticize what was played, but I just think he was capable of something better. And I wondered if, being that this is his first show, was his thought process of, I got to get the song structures down. When there's a solo part, I could just wing it and play a solo. Or did he actually write the solos and these were what he had for the songs? I'm guessing he was winging the solos in some songs. Most guitar players, unless it's something signature, they know the key of the song and they're just playing in that key. And then, they're going to have the style is going to be the same, but they're not playing note for note, you know? Right. And I got to go, I got to think going into these, the tour, you know, the Kiss must have done a lot of rehearsing. I mean, they're not just, you know, recording an album and say, all right, we're ready to go. You know, especially with a new guy who's going to learn a lot of previous material. I mean, how many songs total were from Animalize off this record? I two. You, two, right. So, so, um, yeah, I mean, it could be nerves first night, you know, you're yeah. on stage with state, uh, with Kiss, you know, it's, it's a big thing, you know? Yeah, well, to me, there was nothing, though, that I heard that said, hey, first, and I wondered even how much did he get to rehearse with the band? Because this is, I said before, two months into the tour, they've been playing with Bruce. I think leading up to these shows, they had basically played like five or seven nights in a row, whatever. Now, of course, mm-hmm. they could, you know, sound check in the afternoon and rehearse there. Mm-hmm. But I wondered how much did they even get a chance to rehearse mm-hmm. with Mark or how much was Mark just said, here, learn these 16 songs, whatever it is. And Mark really focused on the structures of Cold Gin and Heavens on Fire and War Machine and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, I heard this and I'm like, eh, I don't hear anything that says they shouldn't have tried to continue going forward with this guy. I think it just comes down to they had started to get comfortable with Bruce for a couple of months. They knew Bruce through Bob and mm. it just felt more comfortable. They have a big show coming up in two weeks that they're going to film and hey we've been playing with this other guy for two months we kind of know him for a number of years he's mm-hmm. doing well i think it was more a compliment to bruce and what he'd accomplished as opposed to a slight on mark is mm-hmm. why they went forward with bruce at least that from my years listening to this first show ever with mark from beginning to end that was my takeaway is that you know hey given more time mark probably could have fit in in that 80s style guitarist that they were looking for at that time and fit in very well absolutely i agree yeah. i agree and the you know, last thing I'll say is 
the cuts in the record, you know, we knew that, you know, Young and Wasted was going to be cut in Rock and Roll All Night. Rock and Roll All Night actually makes it like 95% of the way through the song, right? You know, they get through the, I want to rock and roll all night, party every day, you sing it. They get through all of that. And then as soon as the band comes back, it starts to fade. The song's over. So mm-hmm. to me, that's barely even a cut. Young yeah. and Wasted, it's too bad that it was cut because it's Eric singing and, you know, it would be nice to get a, a full vocal on that. Mm-hmm. But um, I thought the way they spliced it together, at least it, it wasn't anyways near as abrupt as I thought it was going to be. He was mm-hmm. like, all right, you know, that that's okay. Almost to the point that like, if you're not paying attention, you might not even fully realize, but right. you know, if, if you're listening, yeah, he sings the line or two. And then all of a sudden it's guitar solo. I was glad the guitar solo was there to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. As much as I wanted Eric's vocal, I was glad the guitar solo was there. Cause that's what this is all about. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd much rather have the two minute version that they put out there than for them to say, gee, that song was cut on the, t- on the tape. Let's leave it off the release. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd much I, rather have the the incomplete version. So that's. I agree. Look, this got me excited. I'm disappointed because I ordered mine from Japan. That's supposed to come with a sticker and all of that, and it hasn't arrived yet. I got an email that said it shipped and should be here sometime this week, but it's not here yet. I wanted the physical product in my hand, so I had to listen to it, you know, through my, uh, you know, streaming it or whatever. But, mm. but I will look forward to having it this week. Will you buy any of the physical products, or are you just? Yeah, I know you've been yeah. vinyl guy with some of these. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm gonna get the vinyl. I I know it usually goes down. I'm being extremely frugal, and I usually mm-hmm. won't listen to it until I get the you know the physical product. But yeah. um, I didn't pre-order this one, and all of a sudden I saw the day was coming, and we were gonna do this. I'm like, oh shit! Well, I'm not getting it on time, so uh-huh. I'm gonna listen to it. You know, yesterday, and um, and because I knew we were doing this today, so okay. So you'll have the vinyl. I'll have the Japanese CD with my extra little sticker that comes with it which is why i ordered that one and um you know look if you're into kiss to me this is what you off the soundboard series should be all about it should Mm -hmm. be about shows that we didn't know existed this one's very historic and um i think it's gonna be hard for them to top in terms of a surprise Mm -hmm. release i i feel like the next one could only be a disappointment unless it's something so out of left field like mm. a 1973 show that we don't know existed the plating would be cool i don't think it would have as much excitement as this because there is the bootleg mm-hmm. from from 1980 on that but um it's, to me it's gonna be hard to top this one i'll just close saying good job kiss <laughs> you guys mm-hmm. really to me you hit a home run with this one you know yeah, if, if you're absolutely. a kiss fan and this doesn't excite you well maybe you're not a fan of the 80s and that's fine but if, if mm-hmm. you if you like all of the little intricacies of kiss and you're not excited about this uh, i'm not sure what to say but hey everybody's entitled to an opinion absolutely absolutely all right buddy well this has been good i am glad we had a chance to talk about this i look forward to hearing everybody's opinion on what they thought about this um you heard my opinions on what i think is missing and uh, yes i was a little bit crazy with (laughs) with going through and really listening to that with a fine-tuned comb i'm curious to hear would people rather have a two cd release and and have the full 90 minute cassette on the two CD and some pay more money. Um, what did you think of Mark's playing on this? Do you agree with me about Eric Carr and um, anything else that you guys thought about when you were listening to this, leave in the comments. And uh, I think that's a wrap, my friend. It is a wrap. All righty. Well then we haven't done this in a while. Or, you know, as I'm going to call it, Easter Bunny Ringo. Easter Bunny Ringo. (laughs) Easter Bunny Ringo. Well played, my friend. Well played. All right, everybody. (laughs) Have a good one. If you celebrate Easter, enjoy your Easter Bunny Ringo. And um, (laughs) we'll be back in in the future with another episode. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Talk to you soon. (laughs) All righty. There you have it. We look forward to hearing your thoughts and your comments on the newest KISS off the soundboard release. Did you enjoy it as much as we did? What did you think of Mark St. John's playing? What about Eric Carr? Did you think he was the star of the CD? We look forward to hearing all your comments. Also, after recording, I did read that on a few of the European shows, KISS did drop that piece of black diamond I was talking about. I don't remember because I haven't listened to some of those bootlegs in a long time, but if you know, certainly leave a comment below. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. 
You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter as well. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you all next time.